So one notable idea about functions and subroutines is that they often have to do calculations inside of them in order to get the result that we're looking to get. In order to do these various calculations, we may need to use different registers in our processor. Now, the number of registers that we have in ARM are, of course, limited. We don't have an infinite number of registers to work with. So because of this, we may need to reuse a register inside of a function that's already being used outside of the function. In these sorts of situations, we need to be able to preserve what we had before we called the function and then be able to restore it once we're done with the function. You can think of this concept similar to local variables in the function. When we declare a local variable in the function, its scope is to live inside of the function. Once we read the function, we no longer need that variable. So the variable is just um, deallocated and a garbage collector will come and you know remove the memory and all of that fun stuff. So what we're doing here is we're emulating that sort of idea. We're going to allocate some registers in our main sort of aspect of our program. We're going to call our function. We're going to use the same registers. Then we're going to restore the values back to the main. This is done in the background in high level applications. Typically, the compiler is responsible for setting up these sort of register allocations. So this is something that we would see in sort of the low level assembly that comes out of compiling a program. So it's something that is done by your high level languages without you really knowing about it. So let's take a look at the details of this. So suppose that we have a function where, you know, some stuff was happening beforehand and then we call a function and then we continue on as normal afterwards. So maybe some of the stuff that was happening beforehand is using the registers R0 and R1. Maybe they have some values inside of them. So let's say, um, you know, R0 has the value of one. Let's say R1 has the value of three. Now what's gonna happen is we're gonna do a branch for a function. I'm just going to call the function a uh, get value. And then we'll go ahead and create that function. So we'll say get uh, value. And what this function is going to do is it's going to need to use R0 and R1. We'll just pretend all the registers are full right now. And R0 and R1 are the only ones that we can really work with. So um, let's suppose that we're going to use those two. So we're going to say, um, we're going to move some values into R0. Uh, we're going to move some values into R1. And then we're gonna do some sort of calculation. So I'll just add the two together, perhaps, and store the result in R2, and then we'll return back to the link register, and we're done. So in this situation, you can see quite clearly that when we move into this function, R0 and R1 are overridden, right? So if we're gonna compile and load this right now, you know, we would have one and three. Then when we branch, we get five and seven. We do our calculation, but when we come back to the beginning of our function, we no longer have these results available to us, right? We no longer have um, the R0 and R1 values. So to be able to help resolve that, what we're going to do is something interesting here. What we're going to do is we're going to push the values of R0 and R1 onto the stack memory. So we're going to do this. We're going to say push R0, R1. What this is going to do is it's going to place the values of R0 and R1 onto our stack, right? So it's going to place them onto the stack. And then what's going to happen is once we're done doing everything related to this function, we're going to go ahead and pop them off the stack like this. We're going to say pop R0 and R1. And then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, I'm just going to branch to like an end label so that we can just sort of like get somewhere that isn't going to have, um, you know, the function interfering with it because otherwise we just move right into the function again. And that would be the end of this. So what's happening here is when we move the values into R0 and R1, we then push them onto the stack memory. So we'll get pushed over here onto stack memory somewhere. Um, and then what's gonna happen after that is we're gonna call this function. We overwrite R0 and R1, we do our calculation. When we return back to the link register, we come back here. And then what we do is we pop the values off of the stack back into R0 and R1. So it's going to pop those values and place them back where they started. This is preserving the values of R0 and R1 on the stack and then placing them back when they're needed again. So you can see that the result of this is that the values for R0 and R1 don't get overridden. They get used locally in the function, but we don't overwrite them permanently. So let's run this and see what happens. So you can see that we get one and three to R0 and R1, and then we push them onto the stack. If I come over to the stack memory here, you can see we have three and one. 
So when we're thinking about how popping works, just to just to sort of clarify why we're doing this pop the way that we are, what's going to happen is we're going to pop the first thing into the first register and then the second thing into the second register, right? Since the stack pointer currently points at this, you know, FFFFF8 address, what happens is it's going to take the value off of that address, which in this case is one. It's going to pop it onto the first register, which is R0, which is this one here. And then we're going to pop three onto R1 which is this one here, right? So you can see that it just pops one after the other like that, starting at the top and moving down to the bottom. So that hopefully helps you understand a little bit about the ordering of these two operations. Now, when we do our branch, you see that we come into here, we get five in R0, we get seven in R1, we do some calculations with them, and then we branch back to the beginning. When we branch back to the beginning, you see that we hit this pop instruction. Now watch what happens, right? The stack pointer currently points at the location of one and three, right here and here. When we go ahead and run this operation, what you'll see is that R0 is now one and R1 is three. You can see that it actually did preserve those values, right? So it actually did place them back into their respective locations. This shows that we can actually preserve these values so they can be used in the function and then sent back to their original values after the function, right? And then of course we have our branch that just takes us to the end. So hopefully this helps you understand the idea of how we can preserve values in our functions. And we can use these sorts of ideas in a lot of different ways, right? Um, one other way that we can use this is actually with return values, right? Suppose that R2 was also being used. What we could do is we could do something like this. We could say, okay, so push R2 onto the stack. And then when we come back here, we pop them. We'd currently be pointing at R2. So what we can do is we can place it um, in some unused register, right? So if I want to get that return address value, I could say, okay, let's place it into uh, an unused register. Maybe, um, you know, R9 is unused, for instance, right? So that would be able to place us at R9 instead of having to be, you know, somewhere else, right? So instead of having to keep it in R2, we can place it uh, on the stack and then we can retrieve it from the stack afterwards. This would be a more traditional way of returning values. Although I think often values are just returned on the, in the register itself. So we don't really have to worry about this sort of idea because the thing is with values being returned, if you return a value, odds are you're going to be using it at some point in the code, right? At some point soon in the code usually. So what happens is we place it into an unused register and then we just use it, right? So that's the typical case with these um, with these returns. You know, otherwise you'd have to pop it off and place it into its position immediately. So you need it in an empty register regardless. So that's why we don't usually do that. I just wanted to show you that just in case you ever see it. It is something that you can do. I think it's not usually the case that you would end up doing that. So with this, you now have a full picture of subroutines and functions in ARM. You understand more of how to preserve values, how to set values onto the stack and remove them from the stack. And this allows you to be able to write fully functional subroutines for your programs. So that sort of sums up a lot of the logical ideas of what we would typically talk about for sort of an introduction to ARM assembly type course. For the next few videos that I put out, I'm gonna be showing you the ideas of working with hardware with the ARM processor, which is actually gonna be pretty straightforward because we actually have some hardware devices here on the right hand side. So I'm gonna show you how to interact with those hardware devices, get you familiar with hardware, and then we can start to take a look at some other concepts, maybe at a little bit of a higher level and see how we can interact with ARM and other system related processes. So that's sort of where we'll take the next few videos.